Tuesday morning, everybody. I'm Scott Callen here on uh, Between the Ears, and I figured we're going to change some things up. Uh, we haven't done a mailbag in quite a while, and usually I do these. Uh, if, if you are a regular participant in these things, I usually obviously write these things out, uh, but I want to try and do something a little different. We're going to try and do it through uh, video today here on Between the Ears. We'll see how you guys like it, if you like it this way, if you like it uh, the old way, or maybe we can do it both. Uh, so please give your feedback. Uh, hit me up on Twitter at Callahan underscore to let me know what you prefer. And uh, that way we know the best uh, direction to take with this because uh, it is fun. We do get a lot of interaction with it, uh, but I want to make it as fun and, and easy for you as possible. So let's go to our first question of the Mountaineers now between ears mailbag. And that is from not a ball man. And it is, is athletics focusing more on the basketball program after the disappointment last year? What's next? Another rebuild? Did we hire Blaine Stewart to be our next guy? So a fully loaded question there. Um, are they focusing more money on basketball? Um, I don't, I, I can't accurately give that that answer just because I don't have those reports um, on on where those those dollars are being spent but i think it's fairly obvious just from the portal action that they've had in basketball with kirk creaso omar silverio jesse edwards and uh, you know others coming in that they're using a lot of money for basketball um and again this isn't coming from the school this is coming from country roads trust and all those other uh financial support groups out there that are helping support wv athletics but you look at, at the portal in football and it's it's completely different. I mean, they're offering guys from like Louisiana Monroe, uh, West Liberty, um, California, Pennsylvania, which we'll get into that list here in a little bit, but they're not really going after these top echelon guys that are going to come in and just be a star right away. So um, I think too, it would be wise to, to really kind of load up on basketball just because, I mean, let's face it, you're probably going to have a better chance to win a national championship in basketball. I mean, it, it's a hard thing to do now in football. And, uh, yeah, you got a legendary head coach at the helm, too, so you might as well use that money uh, for, for good. Um, but that's not to, to say that they should just give up on football or not to spend money in football. I think they just have to be very wise with how much they spend and where they spend it. So uh, next question comes from, I'm, I'm not even gonna read the, the handle on this because it's super long, but the name is Bebop. If, if Hughley signs, you're speaking about John Hughley here, the pit transfer, how do you think Hugs will incorporate all the bigs? Would Hughley play the four alongside Edwards or come off the bench? That's, that's an interesting question. I would, Personally, I would think they would leave Trey Mitchell at the four, Edwards start at the five, and they probably use a three guard lineup with Kirk Carissa, Tucson, potentially Caleb Grill if he, if he transfers in, um, and then Jose Perez. I, I think they would probably have Hughley coming in off the bench. You got to think too, he had a, an injury, I believe it was a knee injury that he sustained last season, and he tried to play through it, just couldn't. So he had to shut it down. So you got to wonder where that that recovery process is at. So uh, I would say he's probably going to come off the bench. Trey Mitchell at the four just makes a lot of sense. Uh, Jim Santoni, honest prediction of when Hugs retires. I've thought about this a lot. And I want to say like, a year or two, but then you start thinking about the long term of this thing. And I, I really think Huggins wants to get one more really good run in him. I mean, he's talked about it before, but it seems like he's he's always had something pop up, whether it be injuries, uh, tough draw in the tournament. Like it's it's always something. I mean, you go back to the, the COVID year where the, the tournament got shut down. I mean, they were they were on a run. You know, they're, they're picking up some momentum, and I think that team could have made a deep run into the tournament. I'm not saying that had they done it that year that he would have hung it up then, but uh, 
I, I think I, I think he's got at least. I, I, I'm I want to say at least five more years. It sounds crazy, but he is actively recruiting the, this 24 and 25 class really hard and, and some of the top guys in those classes. So I think he wants to see those guys through and maybe make a run with them. So we'll see. I, I say at least five years could be wrong, but that, that's, that's anyone's guess. Next one, Icon Cleamer. I believe is how that one's pronounced. What is your win-loss prediction? And I'm assuming this is for football. Uh, I'm going to go five and seven. It's it's an incredibly tough schedule, and I think five and seven's kind of being generous if we're being honest. I mean, you, you have a, a first-year starting quarterback. You've got a whole new receiving core essentially with four of your top receivers either in the NFL or transferred elsewhere. Uh, you have a lot of new faces on defense, especially up front. A lot of new faces in the secondary. It's uh, it, it's a it's an uphill battle, and I, I don't know how they can get the six wins. I truly don't, especially when you start the season at Penn State. Then two weeks later, you play Pitt, and then you get into the gauntlet of the Big Twelve schedule. So I say five and seven, four and eight isn't really uh, that far of a stretch either. But they do get a break with Central Florida. And Cincinnati being two newcomers on the schedule, uh, I'm not saying that they're uh, they're teams that should be taken lightly by any means, but it's certainly better than having to play Oklahoma and Texas this year. So we'll see how that impacts their record. But I'm going to say five and seven for now. Uh, we're going to Ryan, and that is why are we offering mediocre West Virginia high school football players and quarterbacks being recruited by lesser schools? Well, dang. Come on, Ryan. Let's ease up on these guys now. Come on. Um, and Neil Brown has always said that he's going to recruit the state of West Virginia hard. He's going to do his very best to keep the best talent in this state here. And it doesn't matter if those guys are, are getting Power 5 offers or if they're getting just Group of 5 offers. He's going to keep the best talent here, even if it's in walk-ons. Um, he's going to try and do that uh, as best as he can. I don't know. In terms of the quarterback situation, there's two guys that they're really going after. And um, one of them, Samaj Jones, who is getting who, who is getting uh, heavy interest from Oklahoma and Penn State, Cincinnati. And then the other one is Trey Petty, who uh, recently just put West Virginia in his top list of schools. He's got some power five schools in there as well. So. I don't think the quarterback issue uh, recruiting or the quarterback recruiting is an issue right now. I, re I really don't. You look at what they got uh, last year with Sean Boyle. Uh, it's kind of a late bloomer, but um, very talented kid. You obviously got Nico uh, Marchio, who had a ton of power five offers, was committed to uh, Florida State before ultimately coming to West Virginia. So. Uh, I don't see a problem there. The West Virginia thing, look, you're not going to get four and five star kids coming out of West Virginia, but you got to do your best to keep them here. Um, I, I don't really know how to answer that one. Um, <laughs> this next one, we got a gift from Adam Ger Ger uh, Gerwich. Adam Gerwich says, is this real life? Is this just fantasy? We're all living in fantasy, Adam. We're all living in fantasy. Uh, Chris, with our next question, Jones Avenue, WVU 97. Which will we see first, men's track and field or softball? Hate to burst uh, all hope here, Chris, but neither. <laughs> um, maybe at some point in time, way down the road, uh, one or both of them get added to the athletics department, but it just doesn't seem likely. I mean, Gordon Gee came out. Um, I don't know if he publicly came out or not, but it, there's reports that it came out, I believe it was from the DA, about how they're operating kind of in the negative right now. They're trying to cut back on some expenses. So I, I think that adding another athletic program is kind of a tough ask when you're doing that. And I think partially that's why Ren Baker was brought in because he is good at fundraising and and helping the athletic department grow. So I think they're going to focus on the, the programs that they have now 
And when you look at the top two, football and basketball, you know, football hasn't been very successful in the last four, five, six years. Basketball has only made or has only won one tournament game in the last what four or five years. So I, I think they're they're better served to focus on pouring all their their time and and their money into those two top revenue driving sports. To, so that way they can filter it down and trickle it down through the rest of the, the programs. But um, if I had to take a guess, it'd probably be softball just because of the demand. I think there is a more of a fan interest in softball than there is in men's uh, field track and field. Even though the track and field thing is is interesting because that can that can help pique the interest of some football recruits. We all know about that. So, um, but I would go softball. Next, we're going Isaiah Belcher. How much of the recent big basketball signings do you attribute to Ren Baker? And do you think we see similar things in football? Um, I, I think it has some impact. I think Ren does have some impact, but I, I don't know how much of an impact he has. Obviously, he can't be directly involved. Um, that's, again, a, a country roads trust kind of thing if, if we're talking about NIL. Um, but I think he has to have some hand in it. Um, again, not directly, but I, I think this is more of just Bob Huggins and the legacy that he's kind of built throughout his career and understanding how to adapt to this new age that is the crazy era of, of college uh, sports and, and transfer portal and, and NIL. So he's understanding it now. He's talked about it for the last two years. He's got to get better. He and his staff have to get better at recruiting the portal. I think he's doing a better job each and every single year. Remember that first report, uh, uh, first transfer portal recruiting class that he had, had Damon Kerrigan, Polly, Polly Cap, De, uh, and Malik Curry. I mean, <laughs> No, again, nothing against those guys, but those guys were all playing from lower levels, having to make that jump and be the guy, not come in and fill in as a role player or anything. They were in big parts of this of this team. Last year, obviously, you get Emmett Matthews, Eric Stevenson, Joe Toussaint, some better guys, but guys that were older and, and really only had a year or so left. And then this year, you get the big splashes, right? The Kirk Creases, Jesse Edwards, Jose Perez, if you want to throw him in this year's class, and Marcel Silverio, maybe John Hughley, maybe Caleb Grill. So the the potential, I think, is growing for West Virginia. And I think it's maybe a little bit better than what people thought. Next, we're going to WVU underscore sports underscore info. And it is, do you think the 24 football class will be better or worse than last year with the new coaches? Um, it's too early to tell because I think we're still trying to get a gauge as to what the ceiling of this class is. And I think that's kind of where you judge these things, right? When you're months away from signing day, what's the ceiling of this class? And I don't know that we even have a ballpark idea of what that looks like right now. Over the last week or two, we've seen a lot of official visits getting set up. So we're kind of getting some names filtering through as to who's actually taking West Virginia seriously, who West Virginia is actually taking seriously in this recruiting process. So we'll find out a lot in June. Um, those first two weeks where they have OV set up and we kind of get some more narrowed down list. That's when we'll get a good idea as to what this class could end up looking like come December and February. But uh, I think it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough to match last year because last year you at least had a little bit of, I guess, upward momentum in the in the fact that, okay, you had Graham Harrell, who was this big-time OC, or at least, you know, had the perception of being this big-time OC. You landed JT Daniels, who was, again, this the, percept, the perception was he's this big-time transfer, um, and that was going to be this big explosive offense. You had a defense that – had been very good under Jordan Leslie and under Neil Brown since they've been here. And then they all took a step back. The offense wasn't good. The quarterback play wasn't good. The defense was horrific. So now you're going into year five with Neil Brown, and there's a lot of uncertainty with this future. And I, it's hard to turn your shoulder to that. It really is. So I think 
these recruits understand it. They know the reality of the whole situation. And, you know, I, I'm not here to say like, hey, if, if Neil Brown wins five or six games, he's gone. But if he wins five or six games, he's probably going to be very on edge about being, you know, the head coach for a sixth year. So I, I think recruits see that. They understand it, and it is 100% being recruited against West Virginia. These other schools that are recruiting against West Virginia are using that to their advantage, 100%. Um, so I would probably say it's probably not going to be as big of a – or as – not as big, but maybe not as as good of a class as last year from top to bottom. William Thompson, who is WV looking at in the transfer portal? We know defensive line, wide receiver, and DB are possible needs. Any names you are here? Um, so the Wilson, the Wilson guys, um, Anthony Wilson, out of Georgia Southern, uh, defensive back. You've got Marquise Wilson, uh, a defensive back out of Penn State. No relation, uh, but those two guys in the secondary. For sure, Sean Stevens, West Liberty transfer. They've shown some interest in the He was just on a visit. Uh, is not officially offered as of this recording. That could change. He is visiting Purdue this weekend. Um, so that, or, or maybe he was this past week. I'm not sure. But he, he I, I think he's probably one of their, their back-end options if they don't get one of those Wilson kids. Um, wide receiver, Jaquay Jackson, the Cal PA transfer. Um, is on their board. Um, trying to think here. They just offered. Um, they just offered a kid from UL Monroe, defensive lineman. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. And I just did the article on him too. Just give me. Bear with me a second to, to, to remember his name. It's hard to keep track of all these names when there's football and basketball recruiting going in. You got the portal and high school, junior college kids here and there. Anthony Campbell. So, Anthony Campbell, defensive line transfer from UL Monroe. Uh, Varkis Gums, North Texas tight end. Uh, they, they offered a, uh, a an offensive tackle out of Houston mo- probably two months ago uh, that they're still in on. I, I think it's Cameron Johnson or Cameron Johnson. Cameron or Cameron something. I can't remember it again off the top of my head. Um, but there's definitely a few guys in the portal that they're after. That's only going to continue to grow here over the next week or two once teams close out spring ball and that the transfer portal is open. But we'll really start to see a lot of action rolling in here over the next week or two, even including West Virginia. So be back. Uh, stay tuned because we're going to probably have a video um, discussing all the movement in the portal that's going to happen, uh, not only here at West Virginia, but elsewhere. So. Uh, that's probably the, the most big names that I would say, um, if you want to consider them big names, but just a few names to, to keep out on. Jeremiah Richards with our final question here. Is WVU's offense as weak as it sounds, or did our offense or did our defense become elite? Well, here's how I would answer this question. Again, you're losing Taj Olsen, Jordan Jefferson, Dante Stills up front. You have essentially three young, inexperienced corners and inexperienced at least in this program. And you've got a couple new linebackers in the fold. So, like, I don't think the defense is <laughs> um, Offensively, I mean, again, it's – you're looking at – you got – you know, four or five running backs, a, a really rock solid offensive line, and a bunch of questions at tight end, receiver, and most importantly, quarterback. So I don't think the offense um, is being shut down by an elite defense by any means. So this is exactly kind of why I think we're heading toward a four or five win season once again, uh, just because there's there's not enough there. And I think we're going to see, Neil Brown's talked about it, they need to add another receiver to this team. And when your top guy, Devin Carter, only had 400-some receiving yards last year at NC State, that's that's a a bit of a red flag. So can Carter take that next step and be, you know, an 800, 900-yard receiver? 
maybe, but that's a big ask for a guy that's never done. Um, and to do it in a whole new offense with a new quarterback he's not worked a whole lot with, a quarterback that they don't even know who's going to be under center. So I, I'd say there's a lot of there's a lot of concern right now surrounding the program, and rightfully so. But we'll see what happens. Uh, we'll get a good look at it on Saturday for the spring game. Uh, Chris and I will have our take on what the team looks like after the spring game next week. So be sure to come back for that. That's going to do it for today's uh, Between the Ears mailbag here on Mountaineers Now. I'm Skylar Callahan. You can check out my work on Twitter at Callahan underscore. You can follow us on Twitter and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, both at Mountaineers Now. Uh, it was fun. It's pretty cool. First time doing the mailbag over video. Let me know what you think. Uh, drop a comment on YouTube or again, message me or comment under the link on Twitter about what you like. Do you like the video? Do you like the writing style or maybe even both? So thanks you guys. Thank you guys for tuning in. Have a great week and we'll see you guys here in a few days here on Between the Ears. Take care.